Light, there we go. Okay. So let me pull up. The da -da -da -da. That's a, oh, that's right. I need to get rid of that. Get rid of this. This in here. So here now live on YouTube. I'll hook up the link to that. Let's see here, where where is the link? Where is the link? Okay, my channel. Let's see here, I'll look up Ian Patrick McHugh YouTube. There I am. Let's see here. Uh, ba -ba -ba. Do 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 Okay. Oh, that's very nice. Looks like uh looks like Andrew from my ethics class is subscribed to the channel. That's delightful. Okay. All right, so that's an out to everyone by my gmail account now i'm just going to send out a reminder to everyone on my uh fullerton college email new All right da, 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 da. to paste do 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 Paste. All right, now live on YouTube. Link. And there we go. Let's see if we've got anyone on live chat yet. Not a soul, not a soul apart from yours truly. Well, okay. Um, so I am, I will be right back. Oh, oh, let me, uh, let's here, let's okay, let me grab a pen.
<laughs> when will that get up there? Okay, so going to the bathroom. I will be back shortly. I'm just trying to figure out how to get this to display that. I think I need to put this up here, maybe. Okay, let's see here. Oh, stupid. Most awkward bathroom break ever. Or so I would hope. Oh, let's see here. Will that be red up there? Yes. Oh, look at that. Looks like we got some people in the chat. Who do we have here? Put on your glasses. All right, we got Gabriel Flores. Justin's is here. Someone named Asp Brush. Uh, Sammy Galar is here. There's uh, Tim Magoo, Michael Joe, Janet Suarez. There's Ask Brush again, and Sam Aguilar. Okay, hey, Professor. Didn't realize I had to create a channel to be in the chat. Oh, no. Oh, I didn't realize that either. Oh, my goodness. Uh, 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 say, Sam asks, have I read every book behind me? No, I have not. I've read a good deal of those books, but say some of them are still works in process. Uh, is that true? Do you have to have a... Uh, a YouTube account in order to participate in the chat. I kind of assume that uh, that most people had a uh, an account to follow channels on YouTube, but just say, do you have to, uh, uh, does anyone say, do you, do you think that's a fair assumption that everyone has a YouTube uh, account to uh, follow videos on there? Uh, yes, it, say Justin says, yes, it made me create a channel. Um, uh, it's, um, let's see here. Da, 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 da. Okay. So Gabriel says he's enjoying this. This is good. I already had, Justin says I already had an account, but that wasn't enough. Sam says, yes, you have to, in order to comment, but not to watch. Okay. All right. So in order to comment, but not to watch. Oh my goodness. Oh my goodness, so you have to have a channel to watch streaming videos on here? That I was not aware of. That I was not aware of. Okay, so, um, hmm. Okay, well, in the future then, uh, I will try to use another alternative for doing these video chats. Uh, oh, no, you can watch, but you need the channel to chat. Okay, so you need the channel to be able to do what you're doing right now. You need a channel to uh, to be able to uh, participate in these live chats. Is that is that true? So you uh, to join the chat, you have to create a channel, but you don't need one to watch. Okay, all right, that's uh, uh, no, Alan Allen. Okay, yes, yes. Ooh, 
correct. Ooh, ooh, true. Mm, ooh, ah, ah. This I was not aware of. I apologize. No, I thought, I thought that all anyone needed to participate in this was a YouTube account. Um, so no, I was I was not aware of the fact that you actually need, uh, as I said here, you need to create a channel to join a chat. Well, 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 well. Well, let me ask you this. It's, is it difficult to start a channel? You know, you don't actually have to upload anything to have a channel. Is that correct? Um, is that, um, uh, it was just a click of a button to fix at least, not a big deal. Okay, well, uh, still on the, uh, all the same, I do feel bad for, uh, for making you go through that process. As I say, I didn't know that you needed that to participate in the chat. I thought you just needed an account. So I'm sorry, I, I did not uh, I did not know. Okay, so it is, it is easy. You don't need to actually have videos already to start a channel. Okay, all right, that's 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 good, but say still still I feel bad for that. So I, I apologize. That was a that was something that I had not taken into consideration. Okay, you only need a Google account, says No Alan Allen. Uh, it's actually really easy, says Gabriel. Well, that's well, that's good. The thing is, is say we have to take in consideration uh, older people in our classes, and for them, it might not seem so easy. You know, the, for um, uh, it's not like they couldn't they couldn't figure it out, but say they might not be aware that it, that it would be kind of like a simple and quick process. I says, oh no, I've got to start a channel. Oh God, I don't even have any videos. So. Uh, I'll put out a bulletin about that. Okay. Well, how is everyone doing? Everyone doing okay? Is everyone, uh, um, say, keeping their wits together during quarantine and whatnot? Let's see what you folk have to say about that. Thank you. Thank you, by the way, for for giving me uh, the four one one about how to get on here. Oh, Gabriel, you says you're missing me. Thank you, Gabriel. I miss you too. I miss I miss our chats about movies in the classroom. Okay, how's everyone else doing? Uh, say, uh, uh, say, uh, say, barely. Oh, <laughs> are you starting to get some uh, some cabin fever there? Starting, starting to uh, uh, miss being able to uh, to just go out to a crowded bar, or um, or out to the beach, or or things like that. Even even just kind of like going for a walk. Hey there, Andrew. Uh, good. Uh, say you're doing good. This is good. Myself. I'm doing pretty okay. I'm a homebody anyway. I don't go out all that much. I do miss going out though. I do miss at least having the option of going out when I want to go out. But I'm I'm doing okay over here. In the um, in the last couple of weeks, uh, the only reason that I have gone out to do anything at all is to take the trash out and to go grocery shopping. That's it. Otherwise, I've been in here the entire time. Uh, Asbrush says I miss taking my girlfriend out to eat. I wonder if we'll go back to shaking hands after this. I I think uh, I, I it would be interesting. It would be interesting to see if if uh, if it if it takes us a while to kind of like uh, readjust to to uh, to being in each other's company again. It would be, it'd be interesting to see if uh, if uh, we're initially reluctant to to hug or shake hands or do things like that. Uh, myself, I think. I think we're going to transition back pretty easily. I think I think we won't be able to keep our hands off each other, but that's my prediction. Uh, Janet says, "I miss the gym. I have a lot of friends who are who are gym rats, and uh, they miss the gym too. They miss uh, they, they they regret not having say a lot of uh, workout gear at home. Uh, apparently, say resistant bands are pretty popular right now." For that very reason, that they people just don't have like uh, like a bench press and whatnot. Tim says he's doing well so far. I miss having a, a class in person, though. So do I, Tim. I miss that too. I I uh, you know this is this is not why I got into teaching, of course, and this is not why most of us got into teaching. And this is the very first time I've been doing anything like this. And I must say, it's a lot more work for me doing things like this um, back here at home than it is for me to just go into the classroom. Go in the classroom, say, you actually kind of are able to create much of the uh, curriculum, say, you know, improvising there in front of the students. Here, I've got to plan everything out, and it's, it's not easy. Um, 
Justin says, doing all right over here. I just moved my daily walks earlier, uh, so barely anyone is out. I do miss your lectures. Oh, thank you, Justin. Glad we can at least do this now. Uh, Noel Allen says, the whole situation is like a scene from a movie. Indeed. Nicole Thomas says, I miss being able to go and talk to people. Yes, I I, I do miss that too. I do miss at least having the, the, uh, the option of socializing. I do miss uh, at least uh, being able to say, hey, you know, if I'm if I'm bored, if uh, if I need to uh, see my friends, that I could go out and see my friends. Uh, Tim says I'm doing really well adjusting. To, uh, say uh, you're doing really well adjusting to the new medium. Referring to me, I think. Well, thank you, Tim. Um, how um, how's everyone doing with their classes? How's everyone doing with uh, uh, with their other professors who are trying to adjust to this new situation right now? Ria says, it feels like I'm living the same day over and over again. Oh, yeah, I can I can see I can see how that'd be a problem. Me, me, I like living the same day over and over again. Because say uh say that that means for me to say, oh, oh gee, you know, I'll have enough time to read and to write and to do those kind of things. Unfortunately, that's not how this is kind of wound up for me. Say, um, you know, my what was supposed to be my off time is my work time now. And every every day presents a, a new kind of uh, problem to figure out, like what's happened recently. I did not uh, say for the people who are recently joining, I did not know that you needed to start of a, a channel on YouTube in order to participate in chat. I thought all you needed was an account to participate in a chat. Fortunately, I found out that um, uh, through some of our, our friends here that it's not difficult to start a channel, but still... That was something I had not anticipated. And that's a scary thing. Okay. Uh, you say, Rhea says, uh, not a huge fan of Zoom. And that's what a lot of uh, professors are using right now. And I have I have heard criticisms of it. Um, how does how does Zoom compare to what we're doing right now? Because uh, uh, one of the reasons why I wanted to do this uh, as a YouTube stream was because I, I thought that this would be more accessible to a lot of people. Uh, you know, I can, re I can read the chat, chat going up like this, okay. Uh, so how, do, how does doing this compare to Zoom? Because if, if, uh, if Zoom is better, I'll have to do that. I'll have to transition over that. Uh, Justin says, it was a particularly interesting transition for my German class. Oh, oh I can imagine that. As that one simply can't function properly without person-person instruction. Yeah, I, I had not considered that. I had not considered, say, uh, you know, those kind of classes where, say, it's really, really, really important uh, to ask questions of the students directly and have them respond to you, which which is what you need to do in a language class. Um, uh, so that would be très difficile, as they say in French. Uh, say, what was... Um, What's what's difficulty in German? I'm trying to remember that. I'm trying to remember how to say difficulty in German. Uh, well, say, try to remind me. See if you can remind me. Say what difficulty is in German. Okay. Andrew says I'm way behind my classes right now. I've been working more to replace my class time. Yeah, I think that's um, uh, the administration anticipated this. It says you know that um, you know be. Um, be lenient, uh, be be open and flexible with uh, with our students right now. Uh, you know, don't don't expect them to, to kind of like to just transition into this very very easily. A lot of them might be taking care of their parents. A lot of them might uh, be really adjusting to a new work schedule or working at home. So yeah, this is this is um, this is something where we're we're trying we're trying we're trying as best we can to keep this moving forward. Um, you know, we're not licked yet. We'll we'll figure things out. We'll we'll at least get enough done. And I think that's all that anyone really demands of the situation right now. They know that that people like me, that old dinosaurs who have never done something like this before, that we're not going to be, uh, we're not going to be just uh running out of the gate at um at uh, you know at full speed. That it's going to be a slow and awkward process for us. So we're just looking to get enough done. And we will get enough done. We have every good reason to say that we will. Okay. Uh, say, Alex says, uh, out of all my classes, yours transition the fastest. A lot of my professors are still recognizing their schedules, reorganizing their schedules and procedures. Oh, okay. Well, well, 
Uh, good, good to know. Good to know. I'm at least ahead of the curve with some people, but uh, I hope I hope Alex that your uh, that your professors will be able to adjust things uh, a little bit easier. Uh, way easier to listen to the lectures this way. Uh, oh, way easier to. Um, Sintali, uh, do you Sintali? Uh, uh, do you mean it was way easier to listen to the lectures by Zoom or just doing it as a video chat like this? Please, please let me know. Brian says Zoom makes voice chat available for students. Oh, okay, all right. So, but um, is that an option? Can you do both Zoom and text like this? Uh, because I know that for some students say, and for, well, just some people generally say they, they feel very uncomfortable doing video chats with uh, with audio. So can you do both at the same time with Zoom? Okay, okay. Schwierigkeit, schwierigkeit, schwierigkeit. Schwierigkeit is, so this is sehr schwierigkeit, sehr schwierigkeit. Okay, that is that is difficulty in German. Thank you, Justin. Okay, Gabriel says, the difference between this and Zoom that I found is that Zoom teachers can actually communicate with their students instead of just commenting. Okay, okay. And Zoom does also have a chat option. Okay, so next time I will try to do this as a Zoom chat. I'll try to, I'll try to uh, get Zoom up and running. Okay. Uh, Cintilla says, no easier to do, listen to do um, my lectures via YouTube personally. I think Zoom connection breaks up quite often. Oh, okay, okay. Uh, are we doing okay with this connection right now? Uh, is everyone able to okay, uh, connect okay with this? Uh, Zoom breaks up too much. You see, that's that's what I was um, that's what I was given to understand by by some of the other comments that I've heard that uh, um, whatever whatever kind of system it is, Zoom can definitely be difficult if there are internet issues for students. Okay, okay. So what do you, what do you think it would be the better way to go? Do you think stick with this at least for a while, or to transition to Zoom? Which do you think would be the better option? Because Zoom at least does have the the voice option. It's got that. It's got both voice and text chat. On the other hand, apparently they have uh, you can get connection issues with that. So what wh which way should we go? Do you think which which is the uh, the better option? Okay, uh, Brian is giving me a thumbs up. Justin says, Discord is an option too, if people would prefer. It has both voice and text chat, will be with for an out. They recently upped their cap on live stream viewers to 50 for this lockdown period. Okay, Janet says, this is a lot better. Okay, that's good, Justin. That's good to know that they've upped it to 50. Unfortunately, in the ethics class, say we have over 50 students. Now, I don't expect... You know, uh, I'm. Uh, I, it would be great, but I don't expect all uh, 64 class members of my ethics class to join in on a chat on Discord, uh, or or even this. But on the other hand, we should at least have the the means available, so that if we do have uh, all 64 students signing up at once, they should at least be able to do so. Okay, so I'll think about that all the same. I might say that, you know, for, for students, uh, you know, A through L in their last names, you know, chat with me at this time. For students M through Z, chat with me uh, during this time. That might be able to manage it. But on the other hand, if we can get the full number of students, at least as a possibility for Discord, we may have to do this instead. Okay, uh, Janet says this works a lot better. Julia Garcia says, connection is good for this live stream. I perfectly never use Zoom. Asbrush says, Asbrush, who are you? Who are you, Asbrush? Who are, what is, what is your, uh, what is the name that you would use in my classroom, Asbrush? I can't just keep calling you Asbrush on this. Tell me your name. Um, Cintilla says, it's in, I'm sorry, I keep calling you Centella, you know, which just means just a little bit. Uh, uh, Sit, uh, uh, Sit Lolly says, uh, the live stream hasn't broken up. I think this would be the better option. Justin M says, everybody would be able to hear you. It Oh, oh, it just caps 50 people actively watching the actual video stream. 
just caps for people actively watching the actual video stream. So uh, does that mean that uh, even that the, the chat room would fill up and if you're like the 51st person, you wouldn't be able to uh, watch or participate the stream as it's happening, but you would still be able to watch it later when it's done recording. Is that is that what the situation is? Gabriel says, okay, Justin says, so, so it comes down to how critical it is for people to have the video end of things. Oh, okay, so they would at least still have the audio. They wouldn't be able to watch the video, but they would at least have the um have the audio option. Okay, well that I will take in consideration. It's good. It's at least good to know that they would have the audio option for this. Uh, Brian says we could try both and see which works better. Uh, Brian gave me some laughing until he cries icons. Ah, uh, well, you know, the 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 good thing for you, Brian, is that you don't have to try and see which one works better. I have to try and see which one works better. Say so all you would have to do is participate in it. That's as much trying as you would have to do. Okay, so it's it's on me to get this thing started. So, okay, so we got Zoom as an option. We got uh, Discord as an option. It sounds to me like it's it, like it's a matter of choosing between YouTube streaming and Discord. Uh, if Discord has the uh, the superior connection, if it doesn't have as many um, interruption issues as Zoom does, that definitely is going to make it stronger than Zoom for me. So yeah, so we'll we'll see if we can try. Uh, we'll try both. Okay, Willie P, Willie Paz, that's Willie Paz right there. Alex Irwin said, uh, Willie P says this works a lot better in my opinion. Alex Irwin said this is better. I uh, don't really like Zoom. Okay, so I think I'm gonna, I'm gonna cut out Zoom as an option and it's going to be between this and Discord. Okay, uh, is Discord an app? Um, it is something that I think is both an app and something you could work on your PC. I was recently on a discard, a discard, Discord forum until I discarded it, and I did that on my PC because I, I still, I still do most things on my PC. I, I pretty much just have my phone for uh, communication reasons, and that's pretty much it. Although, although, you know, it is, it is nice to be able to, uh, to like um, uh, flip through the news when I'm on my uh, bus going back home. Man, it's been a long time since I've been on a bus. Okay. Uh, Justin says, it's all a gamble. Everything has server issues right now. That's probably true. I imag imagine that we have got a lot more people online right now than ever before. Uh, okay, thank you for, for giving that info for uh, for Gabriel. Says, it is an app and a PC program. Very good. Alex Urban says, yes, it is an app. Uh, yes, it has app and web browser rarity for me. That is a, that is a big rarity. Okay. All right. So, uh, I think we got a mixture here of people, uh, both from my ethics class and my critical thinking class, and uh, I, uh, a, num a few of you are in both. I know. So, uh, how how do you feel uh, so far about kind of like the way that uh, I'm putting out information that I'm still sending out the lecture notes, and that I am uploading. Uh, video lectures as well. My apologies, by the way, for the atrocious audio for the first critical thinking lecture. Uh, sometime this weekend, I'm going to try to re-upload it. Try to get, try to, you know, say say the same, pretty much the same thing, but with uh, with my better little microphone here. Look at this cute guy. Beep -a -boo. Beep -a -boo. Let's see here. Let's see. This is my this is my friendly robot friend. This is a nice robot. He's going to be helping me do better audio for my videos. Okay, so is is all that very been helpful? Has has it been helpful having say the video lectures, the um, the um, uh, the notes sent out by email and posted on Canvas? And is this a good thing as well? How how is that? Okay. All right. Hopefully, hopefully we did not lose connection right here. It says it stops it. It stops it. Thanks, Justin. Okay. All right. Uh, I still seem to be recording. Okay. Yeah. This is this is not this is nice. Um, uh, just after uh, Justin said that uh, everything has server side issues right now. That's for damn sure. Okay. Okay. Willie P says it's extremely helpful. Thank you, uh, Justin. Uh, and uh, and you're welcome. You're welcome. Um, Justin says it's working nicely for me. Any means of still getting. 
The info that isn't strictly text is ideal. Okay, all right, very good. I'm glad I'm still doing the video stuff. Uh, Cassandra says, yeah. Uh, Julia says, having the video audio lecture is very helpful along with the notes. It's almost like being in class. Well, thank you, Julia. Uh, <laughs> especially when I, especially when I go off on a tangent, especially when I go off on a little rant. That's probably very much like when you're back in class. Uh, just lets me waffle on uh, ad nauseum. Uh, Crystal says, I think the video lectures are helpful in conjunction with the text structure. Thank you. Thank you. Alex says, I appreciate having both forms of the lecture because I can listen to the video form while doing things around the house, and I can also check back the written notes for review. The, yes, this is this is the thing, that while everyone is doing the best they can to help out at home, to do work at home, uh, to even just kind of like keep their wits together at home, having having the, these options, I think, are very good. You know, this is why, this is why you know, podcasts are so popular, that uh, allow, allows you to to decompress and have a, a pleasant voice chat about something in your head is almost kind of like a white noise while you're doing something. It's, it's, it's very, it's very, it's a very good stress reliever. And if, and if what this in any way kind of like helps out in that, in that, in that manner, then so much the better. Okay. So this is good. Okay. I agree. It's both nice to have the lecture and your notes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for the feedback. Okay. All right. So, uh, just, re just to review and say what we've been doing right now in the, um, uh, 30 minutes that we've been uh, going on. So, so this, uh, so the the plan is to continue this chat uh, for the full two hours. So if, if everyone just leaves, I'm I'm just going to uh, I'm just going to be sitting here and, and reading the book. I'm I'm rereading uh, the Critique of Pure Reason right now. So that will keep me nice and occupied, waiting for people to show up in the chat. So if everyone leaves, I will still have this chat going, and I think. I think that's what I, I will have to do if we uh, continue to do this on 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 YouTube or to do it on Discord or some other platform. Is that when I schedule a a uh, an online streaming chat time to be available for that full time? It's almost like I finally have office hours at last. And here here this is what my office would look like if I if I had an office. Uh, so you know I would have my 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 books. Uh, behind me and you in front of me. Okay. By the way, by the way, if any of you go into grad school, if you go into grad school and you're working on a dissertation, this is what it's going to be like for you. Say, so many professors who are involved in working with grad students on their dissertations have taken on so many students so many dissertation projects that more often than not, they are connecting with their students, their dissertation students, this way, uh, through Skype or through uh, some other kind of platform. So, uh, you know, get get used to this if you plan on to go into graduate school and doing a uh, like a, a master's dissertation or a doctoral dissertation. You'll be you'll be talking to your to your uh, to your program advisor to your dissertation advisor a lot in this kind of way. Okay. So, uh, let's move. Uh, so I'll be, I'll be here for the full two hours. I'll be here until three 30. And, uh, we were just talking about say doing this on YouTube versus doing it on another platform. Uh, I've heard, I've heard say not very good things about zoom, but I've heard good things about discord. We might give that a try. Um, uh, uh, so, and the, the good thing about Discord is, unlike unlike YouTube, we don't have to start up a channel. I think you just need an account, and uh, so that's that's what we've been taking care of so far. So, does anyone have any questions regarding the material that we're going over so far? So, here we're, we're um, this is the uh, the one thirty to two thirty period for this chat. So, this was the time where I wanted to be more for the ethics student. So, if anyone has any questions on what we've been covering in ethics, uh, please ask away. Otherwise, if you have any questions you want to ask right now, and if you're in my critical thinking class, you can ask it right now, and I'll be very helpful. I'll be very happy to, to help out as best I can with that. Okay, so does anyone have any ethics questions? Any questions about, say, utilitarianism, uh, about, say, its applications? Because, uh, oh, oh, my apologies for not finishing the lecture yesterday. Um, I, I've, been, I've been trying trying to 
get things moving forward here, but uh, we, ran, we ran into some recent uh, trouble over here uh, re with, uh, with house maintenance. And uh, that held me up a little bit. And I says, oh, man, there's no, there's no way that I'm going to be able to get this done on time. So that's why I'm pushing back the, uh, the lecture that would have gone up yesterday to next Tuesday. So we would have gone on into more things about the, um, how, how we can apply utilitarian ethics. And we would have, we would have talked about uh, animal rights. Okay, so, but if anyone has any kind of like questions right now, about animal rights, about, say, the consideration we should have for animals as suffering creatures, as creatures that can suffer, uh, or, any, or any other way in which we can apply utilitarian questions. Here's another one. Here's, here's something that I wasn't going to uh, include in my lecture notes. What about censorship? Okay. Uh, would that lecture have affected the quiz at all, asked uh, Alex? No. No. Say... The only, the only things you would need for the quiz that I have up right now would have been the lectures that I posted up to last Thursday. So the, you know, just just the last two lectures, actually, not not would have gone up, uh, not what would have gone up yesterday, but just the last two. So if you're in my critical thinking class, it would have been say the uh, uh, the the two lectures I did on biases, the one where I introduced biases. And then the one where I talk about, say, uh, the framing effect bias. Uh, and for the ethics class, it would have been just the two lectures that I've posted so far on utilitarianism. Those would have been the only things you would need for the quiz right now. Okay. Can you contrast old and new utilitarianism? Okay, so old utilitarianism. So we're talking about, say, the utilitarianism of Jeremy Bentham. And what you find in Jeremy Bentham's utilitarianism is still a lot that you will find in the utilitarianism of John Stuart Mill. John Stuart Mill pretty much, uh, say, his major uh, contributions to it was to refine it and at the same time expand it. He expanded it in a kind of way where it became uh, more committed to a philosophy of liberty and of freedom. Um, and also, uh, in, and that also entails, um, making personal individual development more important when we consider, say, whether an action will cause more or less pain. In old utilitarianism, Jeremy Bentham was still about, say, personal liberty, personal freedom. But on the other hand, he was certain that he had found a kind of program that should be able to work for most people, that uh, that he knew, you know, he knew very well that it wouldn't work for everyone. But remember, it's the most happiness for the most amount of people. That that means not necessarily everyone, but for as many people as we can fit into it. And for Jeremy Bentham, say he 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 believed that he had figured out, say, a program of of education and personal development that should work for everyone. This is why, say, for a utilitarian, say, you know, it, it wouldn't it wouldn't be right to encourage children to uh, uh, to uh, to to pursue their interests in a religion, because as far as the utilitarian concern was concerned in Bentham's time, say, religion would not give you the most amount of pleasure versus pain in the end; that it would give you more pain than pleasure, or would stifle your ability. To feel more pleasure, which, according to them, would be to feel more pain. So that's the big difference. The big difference is that, say, for Jeremy Bentham, Jeremy Bentham figures that he has the right kind of program that will work for most people in terms of their own education, development, uh, say, you know, to, to steer, steer people in this direction versus another direction. And also, if he has the right program, that means that the people who are suffering under the program say it's okay because it's going to work out for the most people eventually. That it will work out for the most amount of people down the road. So if you're a worker suffering right now in the factories, if you are a mill hand, if you are down there in the mine working 18-hour shifts, it's unfortunate. You know, 
Jeremy Bentham is not going to say, it's not like your suffering doesn't matter, but it's suffering that is going to work out in the long run according to my program, according to my program about how people should develop and about how society should develop. Now, John Stuart Mill comes around and says, not only can we not anticipate an educational program that has to work for everyone, we can anticipate a societal program that will work out for everyone as well. So that means when it comes to, say, people who are suffering in, in very dangerous jobs and jobs where they have to work really hard and they don't really have any kind of security, any kind of, uh, any kind of like health insurance or anything like that, any, any, anything that could kind of like, you know, uh, help, help them out. Say if they, if they suddenly broke their legs and couldn't work in the mines any longer, what becomes of them? Say Mill is going to say that, no, says, no, we have to protect the people who are working in these kinds of conditions because we can't just figure that, that everything will work out according to one grand program for most people. We have to be able to allow enough people as many people as we can to help guide society. That means we can't just we can't just dictate to everyone how society should go. We should have a program in place that will allow as many people as we can to participate in that society for its development. This was Mill's uh, uh, focus back on individual liberty, personal development individual freedom, that we have to get as many people to be able to develop pro uh, in their own way and develop, say, without having to sacrifice as much of their own potential as they would if they were working 18-hour shifts down in a, in, a, in a dark, dangerous mine. So by focusing more on personal development, Mill is also taking away from old utilitarianism, say, that kind of stigma that it had, that it was actually just an excuse for people to be selfish, that it was an excuse for people to work long hours down in the mine because it's going to benefit us in the end. You know, say Charles Dickens says, this is, this is, just, a, this is just a way to, to, uh, to excuse someone's uh, callousness, to excuse someone's heartlessness if they choose not to do anything for anyone who's suffering right now down the mines. If they say, well, you know, it's all gonna work out better for us in the end, too bad if they die, too bad if they suffer, but they have to for the sake of the right program, for the sake of a uh, uh, some kind of, um, some kind of like free market system that will all work well in the end for everyone if we just let it do what it does. If we don't, if we don't uh, try to guide the market, try to guide capital, try to guide business in any way. Don't intervene. Mill is saying we do need some intervention so that we can get as many people as we can developing their own way because that is ultimately going to benefit everyone. The more people we have who are able to develop their own way as individuals, the richer society becomes for it. Okay. All right, so those are the two big, uh, I would say the biggest differences between old and new utilitarianism. Okay, all right, so uh, so twin I, uh, or twin L, twin I, could you, could you uh, let me know whether that answers your question regarding old and new utilitarianism? Okay, uh, hey there, Meme Ziad. Uh, say, uh, Gabriel asks, for our critical thinking class, uh, our quiz due on Tuesday, um, well, the quiz, the quiz is not due on Tuesday. The quiz is due, uh, today. It's, it's due, uh, the minute before Saturday. So if you got my, if you got my quiz and please let me know, please let me know if you've not gotten the quiz or do not have access to the quiz on Canvas, because you need to send me the answers for the quiz today before Saturday. So the deadline is 11.59 p.m. tonight. Okay. Uh, and yes, Gabriel, I want you to email the quiz answers to me. Okay, so that was the instructions that I sent out um, it, with the Tuesday lecture. The Tuesday lecture says that, uh, you know, how to answer the questions, do you know, 1 through 10, 
and just give me the letter answer. Like, you know, for, for number one, A, for number two, C, for number three, A, for number four, B. Those aren't the answers, but I want you to do it in that style, in that way. Okay, so email the answers to me that way. Um, Sitlali asks, say, are you allowed to ask questions about the quiz? Well, we are kind of in quiz time right now, but just like in quiz time, you can ask me questions about the quiz as long as I'm not just giving you answers about the quiz. Although I feel that maybe I already did that for the utilitarian question. Ah, darn it. Shoot. Shoot. Okay. So I need, I need to get my act uh, together a little bit better regarding that. So you, you got me, you got me twin eye on that one. Very clever of you. Okay. But, um, yeah, ask me questions as long as it's not questions where I'm just going to be giving you the answers if it's a quiz question. Okay. Now, for that one, I do think that was a quiz question, but you got me. You you um uh you you were able to say I was uh, you were, you were able you're able to take the fact that I'm not in a familiar situation and use that to your advantage. Well played. Okay. All right, Alex says I had a hard time connecting the principles of utilitarianism to the ideas of minority versus majority. Okay, so I think I can answer that. I think I can answer that. I think that is something that is uh, uh, I can I can comment on without just kind of like giving you the answers to the quiz. Okay, so for that one, the thing is to say that that the real concern, even when we are talking about the minority. Even when we are talking about, say, the smaller versus the larger number of people, the focus is still on the majority. The maxim of utilitarianism, the maxim that we get from Jeremy Bentham, still applies when we're dealing with John Stuart Mill's utilitarianism. The maxim is the greatest amount of happiness for the greatest number of people. And Mill's idea is that by including more consideration for the minority, for the smaller number of people, that this will eventually work out better for the greater number of people. That if we do not attend to the problems of, minor, of the minority, even, even if it's just a small amount of people who are suffering and working hard for the sake of the majority, we have to take them into consideration because by making them happier, we will end up making the majority happier. By protecting their rights, we will be protecting the rights of the majority as well. And we can we can think of, we can think about uh, say how that could work out. Uh, say for instance that uh, let's say that. Um, Let's 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 uh, let's do a little thought exercise right here. Let's suppose that we are given the option of feeling immense pleasure that almost everyone in the world can feel immense pleasure and immense satisfaction. Everyone except for one person. Except for one person, that person's a little baby. What if we were put into a situation where everyone else in the entire world could feel immense joy, except for this little baby. This baby would actually be suffering, and it would be suffering continuously. It wouldn't die, it would just continue to suffer. And what if our happiness was predicated on the suffering of this little baby? Okay, so this is a question often asked by utilitarians. And the, the, the utilitarian answer is, that baby counts. If that baby is a suffering baby, then we need to consider the feelings of that baby. And even though it may seem like we're actually getting the greatest amount of happiness for the greatest number of people, we are actually not because if we are conscious of the fact that there is a little baby suffering, then we will not be as happy. Even if we were uh, enjoying as much as we could, while a little baby is suffering, we would still not be enjoying as much as we could potentially because of the little baby. So if we're able to alleviate the baby's suffering, 
even though we might lose, say, that intense level of happiness that we would be feeling, we would at least be feeling like we were we were uh, kind of more invested in that other person. We would feel uh, calmer. We would feel we would feel uh, less cruel, less callous, and whatnot. And that kind of happiness might actually count more than, say, just kind of like the happiness that would come from just kind of like you know eating eating good food and having good drink and having a lot of sex and having good times. If we have this guilty area back in our heads, say that takes greater priority than, say, our immediate sensual pleasures. So if we alleviate the baby's ha uh, suffering, we would still be actually bringing more happiness to the greater number of people because it would be, say, a, a, uh, a happiness that comes through the pleasure of knowing we were not causing someone pain. Now, here's the question, however. What if we didn't know that the baby was suffering? Okay, so I'll leave that to answer, uh, leave that to think. Okay, ooh, Gabriel, what kind of message did you retract right there? Okay, uh, you might have already said it, but I'm still confused why the minority is so important. The minority is important because of the potential that the minority has. Say, if we think about, say, uh, the people right now who do not have, say, the best education, who do not have the best food, the best clothing and whatnot. We imagine, say, what can come out of their lives. They could still be productive workers. They could still make things for us. But, but think about the things they would, they would have greater difficulty doing. That if, uh, if, uh, you know, if the minority is not given, say, a proper education, say, a person of that minority group who uh, who might be, say, a very, very talented scientist would not be able to make the contributions that they could without proper education, without the, without the means to learn how to engage with scientific ideas, uh, you know, uh, say, you know, master and to master the... Uh, um, say the periodic table to be able to be master the kinds of ways to uh, to present findings in terms of mathematical formula, data in terms of formula, and so forth. Without being able to do that, we lose a chance of having better science. So, if we have people who are not able to develop as well as everyone else is then everyone else loses out. Everyone else loses out of what that smaller group of people could potentially contribute to the larger group. So it's not like, and here's, here's the problem we're going to be talking about with utilitarianism down the road. It's not like Mill is saying that uh, we need to protect the minority because uh, just as human beings, they have inherent dignity, value, and worth independent of what kinds of consequences we could get out of their labor, out of their interests, out of their pleasure, and so forth. He is saying that we protect the minority because of the consequences it could have for the majority. Remember, utilitarianism is a consequentialist ethics. It's all about results. It's not about your intentions necessarily. It's about, say, what comes out of your actions. When you suppress a group of people, say, are you going to be getting, say, the maximum amount of pleasure out of that, or will it be more pain than pleasure? And Mill is saying, ultimately, it would be more pain, because you would not be able to experience as much as you could through the contributions of the minority, through what they can contribute to art, to industry, to science, to human progress generally, even maybe just to friendship. Even maybe just the fact that maybe your best friend, the best friend you could ever have in your entire life could be amongst that, that smaller group of people who you don't want to have anything to do with because they're different than you somehow. And you want to make sure that they are not coming in, encroaching on, your, on what you think to be your world. You do that, says the utilitarians, and you miss out. 
You miss out on what could be got from that. Okay. Alex asks, would a utilitarian favor uh, favor put in a position to choose between an animal and a human? That's a very good question. So, oh, let me read the next one. Uh, adding to my previous question, if they were equal numbers in both human and animal. Well, if they were equal numbers of both human and animal, the thing is, say, most utilitarians would say that even if we had, say, as many non-human animals as we do humans. By the way, we have more non-human animals than we do humans. Say, humans constitute the minority here. The majority are non-human animals. Uh, think of all the think of all the billions and billions of bugs there are out there. Even if no other animal existed except insects and humans, there would still be uh, a lopsidedness in terms of numbers when it comes to that. But let's let's suppose let's suppose st still there were an equal number of humans and animals, so that we could say that you know that uh, we all uh, constitute an equally distributed world. A utilitarian, most of them anyway, most utilitarians would say that animals still do not experience pleasure quite as we do. That we have a, kind of like a, a greater complexity to what we feel. That we can, uh, you know, that we can feel suffering, but we can feel that some suffering leads to good things down the road, you know. When we go through education, education can be a very painful process. Love can be a very painful process. We go through painful processes all the time. Uh, you know, it's why I don't work out. I don't. I, I don't. I don't care how good I would look. I don't want to go through that process while feeling all that pain. You know, jogging and doing sit-ups and so forth. But other people, they love it. It says it's pain, but I love what it brings me. Uh, you know, I love the results that come from it. I love challenging myself. I love putting myself through the regime. Animals don't quite have the same kind of attitude towards pleasure and pain that we do, for the most part. Some of them are getting more towards the level of human complexity, but most of them are not. You know, you say, you know, uh, a cat a cat would only submit to training if it thought it could get treats out of it. And so would, so would a dog. A dog, a dog sees, say... Uh, kind of like, for, by and large, kind of like, you know, what what is my outcome going to be in terms of like, kind of like my, my immediate needs, my pleasures, and so forth. Not all dogs, of course. You say you want you want to train a, a, a seeing eye dog to kind of like, you know, resist as much as it can. But that's why you don't pet it. That's why you don't pet the dogs. If you pet a seeing eye dog, then it'll get distracted and it'll start saying, ooh, I like this. Give me some more of this. Oh, you know, the, the heck with you, blind guy. You can go walk onto traffic. I want some more of this right now. Okay, so for an animal, the way they experience pleasure is going to be different. And we would have to ask ourselves, say, is it all right for more animals to suffer since they are not actually suffering the same way that we would suffer? Or, on the other hand, could we say it is not right for an animal to suffer because they suffer differently than we do? That we can get over pain a little bit easier than an animal can. We can understand pain in a way that an animal cannot understand pain. And so if nothing actually good is coming out of putting that animal through so much pain, then, especially for the animal, then the utilitarian might say that it is wrong to make any animal suffer because they can't understand it the way that we do. They can't see the results from it the way that we do. So even though we might be able to benefit from it by their suffering, say, if they're not able to kind of like overcome the suffering of it, they're just still suffering creatures, then the utilitarian might say that, uh, that this is as wrong as wrong can be. So there are two schools of thought on it. One favors people because we're able to enjoy more things and with a greater sort of like complexity with a greater kind of like sense of its value than animals others might favor the animal for the opposite reasons because the animal does not feel at pleasure and pain as complexly as com uh, with the greatest amount of complexity as we do that is just suffering for many of them so this is something we really do need to get into when we do the uh, the topic of animal rights in the next lecture.
Okay, so there, there are two schools of thought on this. Uh, Gabriel Flores, for our next written assignment for our critical thinking class, what is it going to be about? Is it going to be about why Quentin Tino is such a horrible director? You know, I, uh, I, I've been thinking about, say, what the next writing assignment is going to be. And um, uh, it's funny you should ask that, that um, for, uh, for the midterm, I will tell you this, for the midterm, there will be an ethic component. This, this by the way, is, is for critical thinking. For, uh, for the essay portion of the midterm, I'm going to be asking you to write an argument in which you try to convince me to enjoy something that you enjoy. Now, you already say many of you, if you're my students, if you're my return students, you know that I have very strong views when it comes to the movies of Quentin Tarantino, of Wes Anderson, Guy Ritchie, and a number of other people. Very strong views regarding it. Negative views. So if you're a fan of Tarantino or of Guy Ritchie, if you really like Snatch, take that question any way you want, try to create an argument in which you try to convince me why I should enjoy this. Why it is that I might be missing something. Because here's what you do in, in art criticism is that you try to show the reader what it is they might be missing. Because when it comes to taste, taste is, is arbitrary and it's not really anything we can argue against. I can't tell you that you're wrong to enjoy the music of Richard Wagner, no matter how many things I tell you about Wagner as a person, the fact that he was a rotten anti-Semite, uh, the fact that he uh, uh, kind of like contributed to a, a culture that made Nazism easier to develop in Germany. I tell you all those things, I can't stop you from enjoying his music, but I might be able to give you some insight into it that may give you a different kind of outlook on it. You know, that if, uh, you know, the, it, it may be because you find out for the first time that Richard Wagner was a dirty anti-Semite, uh, that he was a horrible, 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 egocentric, manipulative, uh, uh, mad, you know, just, uh, just, just an absolute madman in love with himself. If I told you all those things, that might have an effect on the way that you enjoy his music, especially if I tell you it's about the cultural consequences of his music and of his writings. He wasn't just a composer. He, was also, he also wrote many books. So if I tell you these things, it might make a difference. So give me a insight into something, into a work, into a work of art, into a movie, into a video game, uh, into maybe a certain cuisine. Tell me what it is about it that you think I should be, I should be concerned about, or what I should be interested in. So what you want to do is you want to start an argument with a general premise that is saying something that should apply to myself and others. Like, you know, you, uh, you know, you should like movies that expand your understanding of, of how editing can tell a story, how editing can change your mood, how editing can change your uh, perspective on, say, what is happening in a scene. And so here is a movie that has really innovative editing, that is doing stuff with editing that we've never seen in movies before. So you should appreciate these kind of things. So try to give me an argument like that. Okay. Uh, in the midterm. That's going to be the, uh, the midterm uh, essay question for critical thinking. Okay. All right. Alice asks, I don't know if you have the answer for this yet, but do you know if the midterm will be through Canvas or through email? I'm going to try to have it uh, all on Canvas. I'm going to try to have it all on Canvas because that's that's the way they would prefer it to be. They 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 don't like us emailing, say, tests out, and for good reason. You know, you, you, it's easy to distribute them. On the other hand, if everyone has them, uh, and if I'm always writing new ones, I've always written new tests. I've never reused an old test exactly as it was before. There's not that much of an issue there. Um, so, you know, you can't save the answers for that. 
but you know, if I have it on Canvas, you can still write down the answer. So again, it doesn't make that much of a difference. But they would prefer me to have it just on Canvas. So I'm going to see. I'm going to see if I can if I can get um, if I can get kind of a sense whether I would be in any trouble to emailing it out because I really don't I really don't see the point in not doing it, seeing as how the same this you can you can get the same kind of problems having it available on Canvas as it would if I just emailed it. But I will say that if I do email it, it will still be available on Canvas. Now, something I've not done yet that I said that I will do is that I will make it possible for you to see what your current grade is on Canvas. I have not plugged in all the grades yet because right now I don't have all the grades because Campus is still closed and I do not have access to a lot of makeup tests that a lot of students have taken um, recently, as recently as a couple of weeks ago. A lot of students have taken makeup tests. I don't have them. So I don't have uh, I don't have kind of like a, a up-to-date record of everyone's grade yet. So when I'm able to do that, when they're able to let me back on campus to get these things, then I will uh, I will put in all the info onto Canvas and you'll be able to see your grade on there. No one else will be able to see it but you and me, of course. But uh, you will be able to kind of like follow what's going on with that. If you don't like Guy Ritchie, then you don't like the recent Aladdin movie. I haven't seen the recent Aladdin movie. I haven't I haven't seen it. Um, I'm not the biggest fan of Will Smith either. So it's it's got a couple of strikes against it. Uh, it's not like I'm not a fan of Disney, but I'm not a big Guy Ritchie fan, and I'm not a big Will Smith fan. Uh, interestingly enough, there is a movie trope. It's a it's a kind of like a movie cliche, and it's called this is this is what it's called. It's called the magic black man cliche. The magic black man cliche. Look up if if you know the comedy duo of Key and Peele. If you know the comedy duo of Key and Peele, look up their magical black man sketch, and you'll see what I mean. This is a trope that you see a lot in movies of the recent past, where a white guy needs help, and here comes in a uh, an African American man or woman who. Uh, has the insight or the abilities needed to help the white person. The Legend of Bagger Vance is an example of this, where suddenly a, mag a magical uh, African-American... Um, um, what, what's the word for the person who helps out the golfer? What is that, what is that word? Um, what's, a word what's, what's, the, what's the term, people? What's the term, people, for the guy or gal who helps out the golfer. Caddy, caddy, caddy. I just had to remember Caddyshack. That a uh, an African-American caddy suddenly shows up to help out this white guy who's in trouble. You'll see it a lot in movies. Uh, say, uh, that was Will Smith. Will Smith was in another movie where he performed the same action, uh, same role. It was Hitch. If you remember Hitch, Hitch is there to help out Kevin James. He's able to give Kevin James say, the kinds of insights and abilities that Kevin James doesn't have in order to succeed at love. Now we come to Aladdin. Aladdin, Will Smith, is a literal magical black guy, even though he's blue. He's not literal. He's a blue guy. But he's still filling the same kind of role. So it's a, it's a racist trope. It's a racist caricature, this idea that, that, uh, that African-American people are, are, are primarily... They're at the for the service of white people bringing in, say, folk wisdom, folk magic to help them. So it's treating black people as not only as, as being um, as being kind of like there to help white people, but also as kind of like you know being different in a in a certain way. Even though they try to make it a sort of positive way, it's still a very patronizing way, as if black people couldn't be uh, you know uh, the best thing you could say about them would be that they are have magical folk wisdom. So it's an insulting caricature. It's an insulting caricature, and I think it's amusing that it go that uh, Will Smith is just keeps on taking that kind of role. Okay, Caddy, thank you, Tim Magoo, thank you. Um, okay, so so look up, look up. Let, let's see if I can find the uh, the link to that sketch, and I will 
send it to you guys because it's it's very very amusing. I love I love Key and Peel. Okay, okay, Key and Peel magical. Oh, it's it's uh, it's an other word. Uh, it's not uh, um, it's not it's not black guy. It's it's another word. It's a word I'm not going to say, but I will let I will let Key and Peel say it instead. Okay, so let me let me give you the link right here because it's very very funny. So if you if you've been watching movies made in the last forty years or so, you should be able to recognize this. Okay, um, Gabriel asks: Is there a more serious note? When is the midterm for our critical thinking class? Let me pull that up. Let me pull that up in my notes right here. Okay, now let me give you the exact date for it of when the midterm is going to be. All right. So the midterm, it's coming up. It's going to be, I have it scheduled for April 7th. Uh, for, excuse me, I have it scheduled for April 2nd. I may move it forward. I may move it forward and have it say uh, uh, maybe, uh, maybe the week after that because I'm still not sure as to whether we're actually having a a spring break or not. Uh, let me let me ask you this: Say, does anyone know whether we still have a spring break? I've not seen any information by this uh, about this, uh, or at least not any apparent information about this coming from my boss. My boss is in the school, so do we still have a spring break? Do we still have a spring break coming up? Okay, while you get me the answer to that, I will ask, I, I will answer uh, Alex's question. Can you further compare and contrast fallacies and biases? Okay, let me, let me, let me just, uh, uh, let me just check the quiz. Let me make sure I'm not, I'm not giving, I'm going to be giving the answer for that one. Let me just, I don't think I have a question about that, but let me just double check. Okay, so I'm pulling up the quiz right now. Okay. Okay, it doesn't look like I have a specific answer for that one. Okay, so the differences between a fallacy and a bias. A fallacy is a mistake in justification. A fallacy is a mistake in reasoning. A bias, on the other hand, is just a process of thinking. You know, I, it's a process that you do not need to provide justification for all the time. Like, if you're seeing me right now, you're not actually seeing me. You're seeing um, light and shadow play across your computer screens. You're hearing sounds that you're taking to be my voice. It is a recording of my voice. But you're putting these things together and you're getting a sense of me being there as a, as a real person. Even though I'm Many, I'm um, probably many miles away from wherever you are, and you know uh, that there might there might be a time delay, even if we don't take special relativity in consideration here. So that's a bias. That's a bias where you are investing in what you're seeing and hearing, and projecting onto it, projecting onto it, and making you think that it is something that is not. So that is so. In this case, it's the pareidolia bias. It's where you think that you are seeing say a human face or hearing or hearing a human being talk in present time when in fact you are not so that's a bias that is say a narrowing of focus a narrowing of your understanding uh, a a selective apprehension of what's before you because notice that you're you're paying attention to that possibility you're paying attention to the possibility that you're talking to me or that you're you're listening to me, and you're not focused in on say all the stuff about say this being a recording, about it being say just uh, light and shadow playing across the screen. You're not focused on that. You're focused on say engaging with this image as if it were me, engaging with these sounds as if I was talking to you directly. So you don't have to provide justification for it. You just experience it. However, if you were to tell me. I'm talking to a real person right now. And I would say to you, are you? 
And then you try to give me reasons justifying why you are sure that you're talking to a real person right now, even though it's just a recording, even though it's just a, um, a um, play of light and shadow across the stream. Say, I would say, I don't think you're justified with that kind of evidence to say that you are actually talking to a real person right now. So I would say you are, you are uh, committing a fallacy in reasoning. You're assuming that if I'm talking to someone who looks like a person, that it must be a person. That's an assumption in the reasoning that is giving you a false conclusion through false uh, a false connection between premises. So that's the difference there. One of them is a is a just kind of like a, a a psychological process, a way of just kind of like focusing attention, of prioritizing one thing or another. The other way is a process of reasoning. Fallacies are processes of reasoning. Fallacy, uh, yeah, fallacies are processes of reasoning. Biases are processes of just the mind, just the way the mind selectively focuses in on certain information or not. Now, they can be connected together because your uh, if your biases are of a certain kind or are developed in a certain kind of way, they can lead to more fallacious reasoning. And more fallacious reasoning can lead to a stronger bias, but the two aren't really the same thing. They just can be, they can just relate and influence each other in a very intimate kind of way. So does that, does that help? Does that ha answer the question? Let me know if that helps answer the question. Okay. Um, let's see here. Da -da 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 -da. I'm just reading through here. Uh, say, I think, I think spring break is still happening, says Tim. I don't think we're received updates about that yet, says Crystal. So we're going to work on the assumption that spring break is still happening. So I will have the midterm either right before or right after spring break. As a matter of fact, as a matter of fact, you're hearing it here first, folks. You're hearing it from me, folks. I am pushing the midterm date back. I'm going to push it back to April 14th. Okay, so you heard it here first, folks. The midterm date is being pushed back to April 14th. I will be sending out a notification about that as soon as uh, we're done with this live stream. Okay, all right. Okay, let's see here. Uh, all right, uh, that helped a lot. Thank you. You're very, very welcome, Alex. Okay, so any, um, let's see here. How how are we doing for time? Okay, where it's almost it's almost three o'clock. We still still got plenty of time though, because I'll I'll be getting off here at three thirty. I'm going to be getting some water right now. I'm not going to be getting Italian grape juice or Irish lemonade. I'm just getting water, or is it is it vodka? <laughs> There we go. Uh, one of the uh, one of the uh, uh, the uh, disappointments for me during this um, during this pandemic is that uh, I couldn't be there in the classroom with you guys for St. Patrick's Day because I would I would love to have taught you some some Irish because the Irish the, before the English came to Ireland the Irish had their own language we we call it uh, we call it Irish Gaelic and uh, I know a little bit of it and I'll I'll teach you I'll teach you some Irish right now first of all um, um, whiskey. Whiskey comes from an Irish word, and it comes from the Irish word uh, ishkabaha. And ishkabaha means water of life. Now, I'll teach you a little Irish phrase right now that you can use in your everyday life. And I especially would like you to use this phrase if you are not Irish, because Irish Americans, like myself, can be very, very, very annoying, very obnoxious about their Irish heritage. Much, much more than the Irish back home are. Uh, it's like it's like you know, people from New York who come who come over here and suddenly become more New Yorker-ish than they ever were back home. 
it's like that too. So we we Irish, we can be very, very, very annoying, particularly if we are far from home, which is a very annoying movie about Ireland, come to think of it. So here's a phrase I would like you to use on Irish Americans who are being annoying about being Irish. So if you're not Irish, I would like you to especially use this. And here's the phrase, Pog Mahon. Pog Mahon. Use that phrase anytime an Irish person, an Irish American, is giving you shit about not about them being Irish and you not. Pog Mahon means kiss my ass. So say that to them. Say kiss my ass in Irish to them. And 99 times out of 100, that Irish American won't even know what you're talking about. Okay, so Pog Mahon. Okay. Okay, so any uh, any other questions regarding? So we're now uh, we're now in the critical thinking hour. Yeah, we're now in the critical thinking hour. So does anyone have any uh, questions for critical thinking? More about say the biases or the fallacies that we are that we're starting to do? Uh, anything like that? Okay, so just just um, just so you know now. You're hearing it for the first time. I'm, and this will this will be true for both classes that I'm doing, for both the ethics class and the critical thinking class. That the midterm date has been pushed back to April 14th. So I will be sending notifications about that to both the ethics class and the critical thinking class. Why are they the same date for both classes? Because it's easier for me. That's why. Okay. Okay, so any other questions? Any other questions for critical thinking? Or if you're still here from the ethics class, any questions for you guys? Okay, so looks like we might be in a... Oh, uh, can you further explain the halo effect? Okay. Let's, let's, give a, let's give a for instance right here. Let's say that you're in a, a relationship. With someone, your relationship with someone, uh, maybe things started out very well. You're with someone who, and they were very complimentary. They were very helpful. Uh, they were inspiring in a lot of ways. And maybe they made you feel something that you had never felt before. Maybe this is even your first love or the first time, the first time where it seemed like you were getting true love. Maybe that's the first time that you were seeing that you're getting true love in a long time. So you're investing a lot into this relationship. Then things start to change, maybe slowly at first. But gradually there is a big difference in the way this person treats you. The person is starts blaming you for more things starts criticizing you for more things, starts uh, kind of like putting, putting more and more burdens onto you. And even though it hurts, even though it hurts you when they do this to you, even though maybe in some part of your mind you think that it's unfair, you'll still, for the sake of the love that you'd felt before, find excuses for the way they were behaving. And what if other people were putting out, putting this stuff out to you? It says, uh, you know, you, you shouldn't let that person treat you like that. You shouldn't let them talk to you like that. And you say, you don't understand. They're under a lot of pressure at work. I'm not, I'm not, you know, I'm not that bright myself. So I know that I know that I'm, I can be a pain to deal with. You know, it's, it's, I, I just will do whatever I can for them because I know that they are a wonderful person. And you, you just don't know them the way that I know them. You just, you just don't know how to, how to handle when they get that way. You know, I, I know what to do. I know what I'm doing with them. But, it's, you know, it's not, it's, not, it's not them. It's more me. It's, it's, uh, it's just that he doesn't have the, they don't have the kind of like respect. They don't have kind of like the prestige they deserve. No one's really giving them a fair shake show. I sympathize for them. I know that they're going through a lot and I know I'm kind of causing their problems myself. So it's okay. It's okay. And you continue on in this way. Every time this person makes you feel bad, 
You'll try to spin it as if you deserve it or as if it's really not that bad at all. As a matter of fact, they, they, they may even say to you something to you, you know, you're, you're lucky that I even talk to you. You're lucky that you have anyone in your life right, right now, especially me. You know, who else would talk to you? You know, who, el who else would give you the time of day but me? This goes on, and it keeps on going on. But you still try to excuse it and spin it in a positive light. That's the halo effect. That's an example of the halo effect. Okay. All right. So that's a good question. And I, I tried, I know, I think that there is a halo effect question in the quiz. Uh, maybe not. But in any event, I hope, hopefully, hopefully that was, uh, that was helpful in case there was one in the quiz. Okay. All right. Any other questions? Any, anything else coming up? Okay, we might we might be in in some downtime right now, um, so I'll uh, say you know you can you can ask me anything. It doesn't it doesn't have to be about the um, the uh, the classes, the course material. If if you just want to be in conversation with someone right now, I, I'm I'm here. I'm available. Uh, when when a uh, when a question comes up that has to do with course material, I'll have to transition over to that. But if you just want to stay on here and and chat, I will be on here. I'm going to be on here until three thirty. So um, maybe I can ask you this, uh, guys, this something. What are you reading right now? I always kind of want to get a sense of what people are reading, what books are currently popular. And I suspect that say in in this time, say the Harry Potter books are still probably the most widely read fiction in the world right now. So if you're still reading Harry Potter, please let me know because I'd like to see whether that's still the case. But if, uh, if you're reading anything else, please let me please let me know what you're reading right now. I think it's very, very helpful to get a sense of what people are actually reading. And it can be fiction. It can be nonfiction. It can be poetry, science, history, uh, a, a, a book of jokes, a book of how to repair a car, anything like that. Let me know what you guys are reading right now. I'm very interested in that. Okay. All right. So speaking of reading, uh, oh, let's see here, Yoga and the Sacred Fire. Okay. So this this sounds like, say, um, I don't know the title myself, Andrew, but that does sound like a, uh, like a book that would have appeal to you. So tell me about Yoga and Sacred Fire. So we got, we got, and has anyone else read Yoga and the Sacred Fire? All right, Gabriel likes Harry Potter all the way. Very, very good. Uh, Gabriel, if you're familiar with Harry Potter, are you familiar with something called Wizard People, Dear Reader? Let me know if you know something called Wizard People, Dear Reader. Okay. All right, so we got, we got Harry Potter. We got Yoga and the Sacred Fire. Who else has a book? Well, that's a book back here. I've got a number of books back here. No, I, I say to back to Gabriel's question. I have not read them all, but I've read much of them. Okay, and I actually have uh, I've got some literary stuff right here. I've got a little little figurine of one of my favorite authors. This is this is Richard Brodigan right here, and he's holding a copy of his most famous book. It's called uh, his book is called Trout Fishing in America, and it is not a it is not an instructional guide to trout fishing, but trout fishing does figure into it. Okay, so here's, here's old Richard Brodigan. I actually have him standing in front of... These are, these are not all of my Richard Brodigan books, but these are, these are a few of them right here. So we have uh, this one here uh, contains uh, three books by Richard Brodigan, Trout Fishing in America, a book of poetry by him called The Pill Versus the Spring Hill Mine Disaster, and another novel by him called In Watermelon Sugar. This also has three novels by Richard Brodigan. It's got, uh, uh, actually, I would say two novels in a collection of short stories. A uh, short story collection called Revenge of the Lawn. And his novels, The Abortion, and So the Wind Will Not Blow It All the Way. And this last one, these this is three novels. These are three novels by him. Say, A Confederate General from Big Sur, Big Sur, California. 
uh, say, the uh, Dreaming of Babylon. I, I'm trying to read the titles backwards. Dreaming of Babylon and the Hawkline Monster. And um, these uh, these last two right here, Dreaming of Babylon and Hawkline Monster, are actually my favorite books by Richard Brodigan. Okay, I've got to... Uh, let, let me see if I can pull the other Brodigans off of it here. Okay, there's my other three right here. Where's the last one? There it is. Okay. All right. So here are some three other Brodigan books. These are not in print right now, I believe. I think these ones are out of print. These, all of these, all of these are still in print. These, as far as I know, are out of print. Uh, this one is called Sombrero Fallout. Yes, you read that title correctly. Sombrero Fallout. It's about a very cold sombrero that, uh, uh, and the temperature is rising. And this one is called. Willard and his bowling trophies. And this one, it's it's kind of a novel, kind of not a novel, but all of Brodigan's books are kind of novels, kind of not novels. His his books are kind of, you know, his novels are kind of like more, uh, uh, it kind of like reads more as a poem than as a novel uh, normally constructed. But this is the Tokyo Montana Express. Okay, so that's my that's my Richard Brodigan collection right there. So this is this is one of my this is one of my all time favorite authors right here. Okay, and I in the list of books I I sent you guys I I know I included uh, in Watermelon Sugar in there uh, one of uh, Richard Brodigan's books. Okay, so here's here's some information. Uh, I have not heard of it, but uh, I have heard of it, but I haven't read it. Well, it's not. Um, it's not. A, it's not a. It's not a book, Gabriel. It's a. It's a web. Series. Let me. Let me. Uh, it's a YouTube video series. Let me post you the link to it. Uh, Wizard people, dear reader. Now, be warned. This is very divisive. Myself, I think this is probably one of the funniest things I've ever seen in my entire life. For others, it may not be so funny. Now, I know that you've seen a bit of my humor already because I subjected you in my critical thinking class to too many cooks. This is not quite like Too Many Cooks, but you might be able to see that it's on a continuum. So, Wizard People, dear reader, let's see if that's let's see if it's still available on YouTube. Looks like it still is. Okay, all right. Which one has the? Uh... Okay, let's see here. Let me pull this up here. Okay, I'm I'm gonna send you, send you the link for this. Okay. Paste. There we go. Okay. Okay. Uh, Alex says, I've been reading Star Wars novelizations and some David Foster Wallace. Now, there's a combination. Uh, is it Infinite Dr Jest? Or is it uh, one of his collections of essays? What are you, what are you reading by, uh, by DFW? Uh, say, Crystal is reading My Solo Exchange Diary. An autobiographical, uh, autobiographical manga about this woman's experience becoming a manga author. Oh, uh, plus mental illness and growing up as a lesbian in Japan. That sounds really interesting. I, um, I, I, li I like, uh, I like manga and anime, but I think my favorite ma manga and anime are Slice of Life. You know about, uh, you know about people about non non superpowered people. I, I much, I much prefer non superpowered people to the alternative. So I, I like I like I like stories about say people uh, that get, kind of like gives me gives me a sense of what it is as you said what it is to live as a person in a certain environment and so that would be very interesting let me uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna write that name down look that up my solo exchange diary it's very interesting but I you know I also I also like you know your your uh, your more uh, um, show uh, show uh, shonen uh, titles as well uh, prob probably my favorite. Uh, anime and manga is One Piece, but by gar, I'm I'm sick of waiting for that thing to end. Jeez. Okay, my solo exchange diary. I'm gonna write that down. Uh, I'm gonna write down uh, Yoga and the Sacred Fire as well. Yoga and the Sacred Fire. Look that up. Okay. Uh, let's see here. Reading "This Is Water" by David Foster Wallace. Okay, I think I know what that is. I think that's a, uh, I think that's a, a long address that he gave. 
Um, David Foster Wallace was very, very uh, interesting in that he was a he was an, uh, an author uh, kind of in the postmodern movement who still wanted literature to do fairly traditional things, which is, say, uplift the heart, to give people a sense that there really is value, purpose, and meaning in the world. And I think that is a, uh, an address, a, uh, a, a lecture or a talk that he gave in which he was trying to do just that, just not in a, in a, in a somewhat more condensed form, not like an infinite jest form. Okay. Uh, her name is Nagata Kabi. Okay, Nagata Kabi. I'll write that down as the author. Nagata Kabi. Uh, say, Gabriel wants to know what movies, what recent movies have you seen? I don't think I've, uh, I think the most recent movie that I've seen, the most recent movie that I've seen, the most recent movie that I've seen was *Knives Out*, uh, and I've got I've got I've got mixed feelings about *Knives Out*. *Knives Out* and *The Lighthouse* are the two most recent movies I've seen. If you mean by if you mean by recent movies like movies that were recently released, those are the two most recent ones. I haven't seen *Parasite*. I understand *Doctor Sleep* is excellent. I really like to watch both of those, but I haven't seen them yet. Uh, so Knives Out and uh, The Lighthouse are the two most recent movies I've seen. Mostly I, I catch uh, I catch movies as soon as they become kind of like available for Netflix on streaming. Okay, so I got some more info from Andrew. You might be interested is called Beyond the Quantum and it tries to use the theory of quantum physics to prove the existence of God. Okay, Beyond the Quantum. Now I've, I've seen uh, similar arguments using quantum mechanics and part of the problem that uh say with some books like that is that they try to draw positive conclusions from an absence of evidence uh because in in truth say we know say you know we we don't really have that much of a of a s strong secure understanding of quantum mechanics, we get, we understand the math, but we don't know why. Why say this math doesn't seem to compare with uh, with uh, say the uh, with um, uh, with classical mechanics? Say why why do we have to come juggle between the two? So I'll take I'll take a look at it because I'm I'm kind of I'm kind of interested in this in this uh, in this uh, school of literature that uses science in order to make an a an argument. For uh, for uh, for um, for spiritual values or for uh, for religious purpose and whatnot, and it's not like you can't do that, but some of them don't do it that well. And I'm not saying this book is one of them. I'm not saying that. I don't know this book. I've never heard of this book, but you know, I'm I'm interested in looking at it partly because I'm interested in sort of like keeping tabs on this genre of literature. So beyond the quantum. Okay. All right. Beyond the quantum. Uh, well, it, well, it attempts to, well, that's, that's the thing, you know, it, it, it attempts to do so and, you know, good, good for them for attempting to do so. Um, and who knows, maybe, like I said, Andrew, I don't know the book. Maybe they, maybe it succeeds more than others. Maybe it will do better than other books that I've seen of this kind. And if it does do better, I work, I'll recommend it as well. I'll recommend it as well. But say when uh, uh, watch out, watch out for things though, like like what the bleep do we know, and and um, um, uh, think things of that nature, where they where they where they uh, kind of like use use the. Um, the 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 areas of quantum mechanics that we really really do not have kind of like a, a firm foundation for yet, as kind of like a uh, uh, a a uh, 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 an entryway into all kinds of speculation that we can neither um, confirm scientifically nor find say reasons to defend philosophically. That's not and remember remember that in and this is more of a critical thinking thing that. The conclusion could still be true. They could still be right in their conclusions, but they would not have proven it 
by their um, by their you know by by the path of reasoning that they use to defend it. So that's the thing. It, it could still be right, is what I'm saying, and it may actually be right in how it actually defends its claims. So I will take a look at it, Andrew. I think I think I, I will look at both uh, uh, yoga and the sacred fire and beyond the quantum. Okay. Um, uh, let me let me talk a little bit about knives out. I don't know if I talked about this in class. No, I love mystery stories. I love. I love mystery movies. I love mystery books. Um, I, uh, I'm actually trying to write a series of detective stories right now that I will publish under a different name. So if you, if you ever read a story by me, if I can never get it published, but if you ever read a story by me, you know, you, you might wonder whether it's, whether it's me or someone else, or maybe I will just claim that it's, that it's me and it's not actually me. Anyway, I'm I'm trying to write some detective fiction as well. So I love detective stories. I loved I love uh, mystery stories, and I enjoyed the mystery. Although I had figured out the mystery, uh, even 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 when I'm even when I kind of like guess the conclusion, it's always a very kind of like gratifying when I find out that I'm right in the end. Uh, so I I guess I guess who the um, I guess what was going on, and I guess who was behind it before the what they call the denouement at the end of the story. That's where the detective or someone explains everything that had happened, you know, where they solve the mystery. So even though I had figured that out, that didn't that didn't have to diminish my enjoyment of it. What I constitutionally incapable of lying. They didn't have to do that. They could have made her say, you know, uh, you know, uh, you know, they could have made lying difficult for her. They could have made her, you know, just kind of like have a, a an overall uh, kind of like nervous problem when it came to these kind of things. Do that where they where they make her physically incapable of telling a lie and not vomiting. I I not only found that just uh, too in you know, it's it's one it's one of those things where it's a detail that is so so improbable that it takes me out of the story. So they didn't need to have that. And I also didn't kind of like how, what that, what that kind of like did for her as not only as a, uh, a character, but also kind of like as, as the, the kind of, the kind of person that she was supposed to represent. That she was, you know, the, a, a hardworking, honest uh, a child of illegal immigrants. So she, she was just, she was just, you know, she was a a a, pers a person kind of like representing a whole group of people, and you know, I certainly do not like anyone who demonizes, say, immigrants. You know, I, I'm the ancestor. Of, I'm I'm not the ancestor. I'm the descendant of immigrants myself. So are most people here in the United States. If you're not if you're not descended from Native Americans, you're descended from immigrants. You're descended from immigrants and colonists. You know. You, you came from someplace else you and you came onto someone else's land so so it's not it's not it's not like that I don't like that she is a person who is incapable of lying and also the child of immigrants I don't like the kind of the the kind of way in which that is supposed to kind of like get you entirely on her side because it dehumanizes her in a way remember when we were when I was earlier talking about say the trope of the magical black person and how that is actually a way of dehumanizing African Americans because it's taking African Americans and not only making their purpose something that is just supposed to uh, serve the problems of white people, but it's also kind of like making them other than human beings, not better, different. You know that they they have they have qualities that are not like us, not like not like us. Say us very flawed people. You know they they are some they are somehow beyond them. And the they did that with her character as well. And you know, good for her for being nice, for being kind, for being uh, forgiving. But they made her so nice and so kind and so forgiving and incapable of, of lying, and all of these things that made her kind of like more, more of an image 
of a person, of a certain kind of person, and less of an actual human being. And that's what we would want, I think, in any movie about people, is for them to be actually be people. So I like how it wound up in the end. Spoilers, it winds up working out for her. I was very, very happy for that. And I was very, very happy how she uh, stood up to Michael Shannon when Michael Shannon was uh, threatening to use uh, the law to to get the uh, you know to get to get to uh, to get her family thrown out of the country. Where she said, "Well, we've got the money now, so you know we can hire even better lawyers to get my family in the country." So that was good. I wanted more of that. I want to be able to kind of like more of her turning the tables on them in that sort of way, and not a way where her extra human side of her character wound up being say what actually led to their undoing that's actually kind of how how daniel craig sums it up in the end that say that because this person is perfect this scheme fell apart that uh captain america's scheme did not work in the end so i found i found it i found it actually patronizing that they did that to her character that they made they made her say more than an average human being because i don't think i don't think that needed to be there and they could even have many of the same things including the uh, you know her uh you know just uh, just uh, her difficulty in telling a lie just because maybe she's got such a nervous disposition but say she has a a, a physical condition where she can't do it that's absurd no so that that i did not like that I did not like in Knives Out because it sets things up in a kind of way where you're 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 put in a position where you're kind of like forced to like or admire a person, and I should be able to to like and admire a person for them as a person, and not for say something engineered into her character as this kind of like extra human, uh, superhuman kind of person. So that's it. So it's a it's a delicate issue because you say you will always find me say to be a person who will who will champion say the um, uh, the, the 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 cause of of immigrants here versus say racists that would demonize them and all that kind of thing. So it's it's difficult talking about it, but I actually think that in their attempt to create a positive figure for uh, for immigrants here in America that they they failed to do so. They failed to do so in a kind of way by actually making her less like a human being, less like a real person. I think it was it was a a, a perhaps a well-intentioned but a failed attempt. So that's why I did not care entirely for knives out. Even though it's got many good things to uh, to recommend for, I did not like Knives Out entirely for that reason. Uh, when when um, also also her uh, it, it still kind of like makes things work out a little too well for the uh, for that family too. Well, like that that girl, the girl who sold out the nurse's family, who told who told uh, uh, her relatives that uh, the nurses mother and and uh, rest of her family are 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 uh, are illegal are illegal immigrants and when they see each other and she says oh, i'm so, i'm sorry i ratted you out like that and she just gives her a big hug and they hug each other and says it's okay it's okay i didn't i didn't find that credible i would have like i would have liked to have at least had kind of like a, a like a a, a sidelong glance look at her like you know seriously you put my family in danger and you think you can just apologize like that for it and everything's going to be okay? It would be nice if she uh, they find some kind of reconciliation and forgiveness, but for it to happen like that? No, no. It, should, it shouldn't be that easy, I think. No. Because what did she learn then? What did that person learn who betrayed her friend's family? Who betrayed her friend and her friend's family? What did she actually learn from that? She, uh, I think, it's just going to kind of reaffirm in her, in her a sense that she could do anything as long as she apologizes for it. So, there is that. Okay, so I hope you enjoyed this uh, this rant about Knives Out. Uh, any other questions?
And uh, by the way, Andrew, Andrew, are you still there? Andrew, let me know if you're still there. Let me know if you're still there, Andrew. We've got eight people in the chat right now. Um, oh, let me let me know. I've examined the pros, cons, logistics in general of using Discord and YouTube concurrently for these live discussions and sent you email about my findings. Thank you, Justin. Thank you. That'll be very, very helpful. Okay, Andrew, uh, I just want to make sure I um I, I just want to make sure that I, I I didn't come off as too too negative in what I was talking about regarding what uh, Beyond the Quantum sounds like. Because like I said, I haven't read it. I don't know. It would be wrong of me to dismiss it. And, um, you know, that there are good books out there like that. So I just want to make sure that I didn't come off as a, uh, you know, I, 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 I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not putting you down for, for reading it. I just want to say that I'm, inter I'm interested in looking at it, but I have, I have certain suspicions. That's all. So I'm hopefully I'm not putting you down or or anything like that. So I I, I apologize if I can't if I if I said anything that was that was uh, unjustly harsh or critical or negative in in my in my spiel about it. Okay, so please please let me know. You don't have to, you don't have to answer in this if you don't want to. Write write me an email or send me send me a message or you can respond to it here if you like. But if you want to make it a kind of like a private conversation, please by all means do so. Okay, Gabriel, I agree with you about Knives Out. Thank you, Gabriel. So, uh, yeah, they they did not need that that thing about her that kind of like made it too too unbelievable for me. Uh, otherwise, otherwise, I I enjoyed the movie. I like Daniel. I like Daniel Craig a lot. I've and I've never seen Daniel Craig in a James Bond movie because I've never watched a James Bond movie. But I love Daniel Craig in uh, Logan Lucky. If you've ever seen that movie, Logan Lucky is a great movie. Um, they, they call, they call it, um, uh, they call it the red state, uh, oceans 11. I like it a lot more than oceans 11. I like, I like, I like, I much prefer, I much prefer say watching movies where, where people, you know, that I, that I recognize, you know, as, as, you know, coming, coming from a working, working class background myself that, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's these people who are able to kind of like get an edge, over the man and get an e get an edge over the over the big corporations, uh, rather than say a bunch of smooth, sophisticated con men, say you know just sashaying their way into a casino and and uh, and taking the lot. Nah, I'm not quite as invested in that as about say you know just uh, you know uh, working class people like my like the people I grew up with, like my family, you know, getting their own back. Okay. Okay. How do I feel about Ryan Wilson? Uh, not Ryan Wilson. I, I, I read that as Rain Wilson. I said, no, it's not Rain, it's Ryan. But I still said Rain Wilson. How do you feel about Ryan uh, Johnson as a director? I think he's um, he has the same problem. Uh, I can't. I, I think he's a very competent director. I think I think that he, um, uh, or at least he surrounds himself with very competent technicians. And he's a very. The best thing I will say about about Ryan Johnson is that he's a very skilled director of actors and that was an actor's movie the best thing i would say about knives out is that it's an actor's movie and you got great performances in there and it was a joy it was an absolute joy um seeing m emmett walsh again i said my god m emmett walsh is still alive and he's in a movie that's great but uh um as a director who uh directs his own adapted scripts i got big problems with you may have seen a movie by him called Brick, which was uh, the most convoluted uh, kind of mystery story ever. They they try they tried it. It was it was kind of like a, a a Bugsy Malone or Hawk Jones for The Big Sleep. Uh, they try they try to do say a story amongst, amongst teenagers and uh, make it make it uh, say a thousand times even more convoluted than The Big Sleep or. Uh, or about or or uh, or Red Harvest, or you know, one of the one of the great books by Chandler or Dashiell Hammett, you know, with this impossibly uh, complex Chinese puzzle of a plot. Um, it's the uh, the uh, it's just like like Knives Out, Brick, and other things that I've seen by him are just feel too artificial. Say the dialogue is just a little too clever. 
the situations are a little too improbable. Uh, it's 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 uh, it's like a Wes Anderson film. It feels like I'm in a toy shop. It feels it feels like I'm I'm uh, just uh, I'm just viewing someone's little puppet theater performance uh, that goes on far 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 too long for any good puppet theater performance, and that's that's pretty much it. Um, I, but like I said, he's a very good actor's director, and I was very happy to see uh, a favorite actor of mine from the 90s, who I haven't seen for a while, Lucas Haas. Lucas Haas has a very good juicy role in Brick, and he should have been in more movies, Lucas Haas. It's, it's, a, it's a shame. It's a shame when the people you like don't get the roles they deserve. Okay. Uh, so, all right. So, uh, Andrew says, no worries. I'm looking at these books with an open mind. Very good. I'm not really looking at these books as if they are fact. I'm just trying to understand different perspectives. Very good, very good, Andrew. And you know, I need to do it the same way, even though that it it has aromas of things that I've encountered before. I need to keep an open mind too about it, as as you have to in this business. Um, there are certain things that at a certain point you can start to kind of like close your mind to, like when it comes to like, is the Earth really round or is it really flat? Those kind of things you don't really need an open mind for, but other things, best if you do keep an open mind about it. Very good. Okay. Okay. Um, thank you, Gabriel, for emailing me the quiz. Okay. Um, and uh, thank you, Andrew. You didn't think I was criticizing in a negative way. Thank you very much. I'm I'm very worried about that because it's, uh, it's a bad tendency that I have where someone comes up to me with something they're interested in and just because it sounds like something I'm already familiar with, I'll talk about that as if that's what they're actually talking about. Say so in logic, that's called the straw man argument. And uh, since I haven't read the book, to treat it as if I knew it to be exactly this other kind of thing would be to straw man that. All right, so I have a bad tendency to do that. So I'm, gl I'm glad I didn't do it this time. Okay, so... Um, Oh, oh, and didn't didn't uh, didn't Ryan Johnson do a movie called uh, The Brothers Bloom? The look the look more Wes Anderson y than anything Wes Anderson's even done, which is a feat. And it's not it's not like that I don't like movies with a lot of artifice in it. Uh, I love uh, Jean Genet movies, but there is a kind of lightheartedness to those movies that you don't find in Ryan Johnson or Wes Anderson. You're supposed to say it, it's kind of a, like the, you know, I'm, I'm supposed to kind of like admire just how, uh, just how mannered it is or that, uh, you know, that, um, uh, that if I, if I, if I don't enjoy this, this deadpan uh, line delivery and very stilted dialogue and whatnot, or that uh, in, in Wes Anderson or that I, 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 I'm getting I'm getting a little fed up with all the with all the the clever one-liners that aren't letting me emotionally invest in anyone that's going on. Everyone feels just at such a, an emotional distance from each other that somehow this is this is something wrong with me. Something wrong with with uh, with my uh, ability to enjoy a movie. That's how it feels. That's that's the chip on my shoulder when I watch them. Okay, so I think it's uh, we're going to be wrapping things up in a little bit. Say by the clock, I see that I've got three more minutes. So if any of you still have time uh, to ask a question, please do so right now. It can be about ethics, it can be about critical thinking, or anything else. If you're uh, interested in, say, what's happening right now in politics, I've been trying to keep abreast of that, or in the economy, uh, say, and just kind of like, you know, in the, say all this uh, chaos that's going on thanks to the, uh, thanks to the COVID-19 virus. Um, we're going to get through it. We're going to get through it. And I, I'm very interested in seeing what it's going to be like when we get out of the other end. When we get out of the other end, are we, are we going to try to shift things back to normal as if this never happened? Because, you know, things have kind of like a tendency of going back, even when we think that it won't. You know, after 9-11, everyone was talking about, say, oh, everything's changed. Nothing will go back as they were before. And I would I would leave uh, uh, a backpack at a at my desk in the library and go out and try to find a book. And then 
five minutes later, I find that it's been confiscated. It says, you just can't do that any longer. The world's different. Now no one cares. No one cares if I leave my things around for a while. So things have a tendency sometimes to go back to uh, a degree of normality. Never the same, never exactly the same, but it goes back sometimes more than we expect that they will. So I'll be very interested in seeing what actually changes and what might actually stay a little bit the same as we move past this. Uh, you think people are overreacting a little bit too much? No, I do not think people are overreacting to this. If, if what we're trying to do is to stem the spread of the virus, um, someone, someone actually put it best, a health, uh, healthcare worker put it best. He said, we want to do something, you know, if we are effective in what we're doing, it will look afterwards as if we overreacted. Afterwards, we wanted to seem like, you know, there really wasn't that much to worry about because of how well we responded to it right now. This is something that, uh, you know, that if you're a person my age or younger, you don't have to worry too much about, but it can still be fatal. It can still kill you. There's still a chance of that happening. But it is even greater chance that it will hurt older people. So we don't want that to happen. And, you know, the, the lieutenant governor of Texas the other day saying that, uh, you know, the older people wouldn't mind dying for the sake of, of bringing the stock market back to what it was a few weeks ago is a, a, a statement of such ludicrousness and of such callousness that, boy, howdy, uh, I hope he gets run out of town on a rail. I say, you know, Texans talk a big game, but say, I don't see I don't see many people going to him with tar and feathers. So, no, I don't think we're overreacting a bit. I think that uh, if we are trying to actually stem the spread of something that is a new disease and we do not have a real treatment for it yet, a treatment suited to the disease, we are not overreacting. So keep that in mind, folks. We do not yet have a vaccine for it. We have positive indications of some people may have found it but you need to test these things and testing takes time. So no, we are dealing with a new situation that requires, say, us to be cautious in a way that we've had not had to be for a while. Uh, Justin says, I think it's about people taking it too seriously, not seriously enough. Some people are still going out and having beach parties while others are over buying necessities. Okay, Justin, that's a good point. The people who are overacting in the sense that say not of kind of like social distancing, or quarantining, but in the sense of kind of like going out and trying to buy out all the toilet paper and paper towels and Kleenex and hand sanitizer over at Walmart and over at Target and so forth. Yes, that's overreacting. That's being irresponsible. That's, that's acting in, in a kind of way where it is not the proper response to the situation. And it's not like it's overacting because the situation is not bad or important, but it's not the proper response in the sense that say, you, your actions need to make it so that other people can also do what they need to do to properly respond to the situation. If you're buying up all the hand sanitizer and all the things from the supermarket, you're making it harder now for other people to respond to the situation properly. You're making them panic and you're denying them the supplies that they need. So you're absolutely right, Justin. In that sense, we are finding people who are overreacting to it. So, yes, yeah, so those are the extremes. Those are the extremes. Okay, so that that is what I meant. Okay, all right. Sorry, Gabriel, I misunderstood what you meant right there. I thought... I thought maybe you meant about this whole thing about, say, uh, staying inside and social distancing and uh, and um, uh, not being at work or not being at school and things like that. In those cases, we're not overreacting because we do not have anything yet that can treat it. We're trying to get it. I have faith in the collective brain power of the human race, especially when they all work on the same problem, to find a solution. So I think we've got we've got very good chances on this. I say we're we're actually a little bit more focused on it than we uh, than we were for cancer for AIDS. That's for damn sure. Okay, so uh, so the people said we've never had anything like this in modern times. Yes, we have. We had what was called the AIDS crisis. You just didn't care about it because you didn't think it would affect you how everyone else felt. Okay, okay. So we're gonna we're gonna call it quits right there, folks. Thanks for joining me. Uh, thank you, uh, Justin, and for everyone else who uh, gave 
very good constructive feedback on on uh, on the format. Thank you everyone for asking questions. Uh, I hope this was helpful. And I'll talk to you about say when we're going to schedule it next time. Maybe maybe we'll have the. Um, I'm I'm hoping to have this every Friday, an every Friday kind of thing. Okay. So I'll, uh, so I'll be seeing you, as I say, on the prisoner, and there, and you know, give those old folks a call. Make sure they're doing okay. Don't go visit them, but call them. Make sure you're they know that you're still thinking about them. Okay. So bye bye, and you know, Godspeed and good luck. Now, how do I end this thing?